Good afternoon, and thank you for, for sticking with us, those of you that have been with us all day. For anyone that's joining us for the first time, my name is Jake Bagard. I serve as the Program Manager of the Common Ground Initiative here in the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies. And as you can see, we are on to our next keynote address. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Noreen Myers from the Progressive Women's Alliance and the Grand Valley Board of Trustees to introduce our next speaker, Matthew Iglesias. Let's welcome Noreen. In this time of negative polarization, where high numbers of individuals support a political party, not so much because they agree with its tenets, but rather because they fear and despise the other side, I'm grateful for the Hollenstein Center's Common Ground Initiative for creating space to listen and absorb different perspectives, a critical endeavor. When quoting our Michigan's um, US Representative Alyssa Slotkin, who has said, one half of the country feels that it's enlightened and the other half resents it. Our speaker, Matthew Iglesias, takes ideological diversity very seriously and as a writer, blogger, and podcaster, he is widely respected for bringing intellectual rigor to what, would cons what some would consider to be tedious matters. Born and raised in New York City, he graduated from Harvard and quickly became an influ influential journalist, writing for leading po publications such as Think Progress, The American Prospect, The Atlantic, and Slate. In his spare time, he authored three books, most recently the provocatively titled One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. In 2014, he left Slate to start Vox along with Ezra Klein and Melissa Bell. Vox is an excellent explanatory journalism site which averages two million views per month and Matthew's pieces on both politics and economics have significantly impacted public policy outcomes. Explaining that he had concerns about ideological diversity of Vox, he left it to create the Substack platform's slow, bo slow boring newsletter while continuing to host Vox's The Weeds broadcast, po podcast, excuse me. Anything but boring, he addresses topics such as the radical transformation of white liberals' understanding of race to the long-term decay of the American political system. Andrew Sullivan, the compelling thought leader from the right, pays tribute to Matthew by taking nominations for the Iglesias Award, which honors writers, politicians, columnists, and pundits who actually criticize their own side, making em make em enemies among political allies and generally risk something for the sake of saying what they believe. This morning, waking up in the Midwest, Matthew tweeted a sentence which may be somewhat risky for this audience. Quote, it feels unintuitive for Michigan to be in the Eastern time zone. So let's let him explain whether he was referring to culture or geography. Please welcome Matthew Iglesias. Thank you, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. This is my, my first public speaking since I think March 2nd, 2020. So I'm a, a little nervous, but I, I hope I still remember how to do it. And I wanna say in my defense, you know, in the Detroit airport, they have like, these announcements and they're reminding you that it's the Eastern time zone because I think a lot of people get confused. And I was there one time in like a Chili's or something and I thought I had like a full hour to get my plane. And then I heard on there, they said, you know, we're in the Eastern time zone. I thought, holy shit, you know, I better scramble. So, you know, it's a lovely state, but it seems very far west of the East Coast. I don't know. Um, so I turned 40 this spring and Something that doctors don't tell you about is that once you turn 40, you get this just overwhelming urge to start your talks by talking about how things were when you were young to contextualize things. Um, so, you know, I think it's useful to think about where progressives were 15 to 20 years ago when I first moved to Washington, when I was starting out. I was working at a little magazine called The American Prospect, and, and there was a big split in the Democratic Party. There was um, new Democrats, and we were in the other faction. We were, I don't know if you want to call us old Democrats, uh, we were labor liberals. Uh, and so we thought Democrats should try to build a politics grounded in the sort of FDR, LBJ tradition, unions, the welfare state, and we should you know, try to do a better job of navigating racial tensions than had been done back then. But we wanted to sort of transcend 
those divisions. Uh, and then the New Democrats thought, you know, we should really double down on the economic legacy of Bill Clinton. We should have free trade, balanced budgets, education reform, reinventing government. Uh, and so those two ideas also had different ideas about politics, right? Who were going to be the voters for these different versions of the progressive agenda? Uh, the New Democrats were really excited about the increasing kind of social and cultural liberalism of educated suburbanites. Uh, labor liberals would say, you know, whites, white people with no college degree, that's still a majority of the country. And then both sides would agree that non-white voters, African Americans, and especially the growing Latino electorate, were gonna be very important to the future. But we had different interpretations of, of how that looked. So you look back on those debates from today, and it feels a little bit strange. Um, on policy, it seems like the New Democrats completely lost. You know, like even Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, they're not talking about deficit reduction. They're not talking about entitlement reform. So Democrats disagree about a lot of things, but they're all in agreement that we should expand the welfare state. It's just a question of how much. Biden's not doing new trade deals. He hasn't even rolled back Trump's tariffs. Uh, education reform, which was the other sort of big pillar of Clinton, Bush, Obama consensus, that's like, that's done with. So my old boss, uh, Bob Kuttner, he, he's gotten everything he ever wanted out of the policy trajectory. But on the electoral demographics, it's totally the opposite. Uh, first Barack Obama, then Hillary Clinton, then Joe Biden, they've done worse and worse and worse than Al Gore with white people who don't have college degrees, but they've done better and better and better with college educated professionals. Um, so those are the voters that the New Democrats were supposed to be courting with their, I don't know, neoliberal economic agenda. And they got courted successfully, but without making the policy changes that were supposed to bring them along. Uh, but at the same time, adopting this more populist economic message, like we, we used to say we wanted, it hasn't helped Democrats with the non-college white voters who it was supposed to bring along. So what went wrong here? Um, I don't know, that's the, that's the short answer. Um, you see the same thing globally in Germany, the United Kingdom, Canada, any country you look at, educated professionals have become the core electoral constituency for progressive politics, even though progressive parties have abandoned the sort of 90s style third way approach. Um, so if you wanna know what's now in progressive politics, what's remarkable to me is how old fashioned it would have seemed 15 years ago. Democrats wanna invest in childcare programs, they want preschool, they want cash payments to needy parents, they wanna expand Medicare, they wanna expand Medicaid, they want more public subsidy for higher education, they want more subsidy for elder care, they want more subsidy for parental leave. You have a moderate faction of the party who looks at that they look at all of that and they say, oh, that's, that's too much money. Uh, but so, you know, they want to do just some of it. There's this whole big negotiation happening right now in DC and it's about how much do you spend? How much do you expand? So it's a really sort of universal consensus that the Clinton era repositioning around balanced budgets, stuff like that was a mistake and Democrats should, should really push for a transformation of the American social model creates something more like a European or a Canadian kind of welfare state. And, you know, I, I think there's a good reason for that, right? If you compare the United States to other countries around the world, we have a lot of great stuff happening here. There are so many indicators where America is number one or number two, where we are leading the world. But there's a few indicators where we're not, right? We have an unusually high rate of child poverty. We're unique in the number of people who experience bankruptcy after some kind of major illness. And so progressives are trying to address those, those kind of flaws. I think that's a totally, you know, it's a reasonable agenda. It's something I believe in. It's a good thing to work on. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of fights about this, but I think it's a pretty clear sort of consensus agenda. That's what the progressive movement basically is. It's what it wants to do. What's interesting, though, is that you don't see an incredible amount of emotional engagement around these issues. That's the policy agenda that's happening in Congress, uh, but it's not something that's brought thousands of people out in the streets to march for, right? There aren't huge protests demanding that we pass Joe Biden's Build Back Better bill. 
Um, the social movement that's really engaged people on a mass level was Black Lives Matter, of course. That brought out huge crowds, people of all races, into the streets of, of every city. And it's also really transformed progressive institutions. I mean, any institution under the sun that's heavily influenced by sort of young, urbanized college graduates it has really uh, embarked on new diversity initiatives. They've recommitted themselves to anti-racism. Institutions that are explicitly progressive have taken this even further. Um, they're more and more, they're centering anti-racism themes in their own work. And, and sometimes, you know, this can seem a little bit peripheral to institutions' core missions, but they want to draw that connection because they know that that's the kind of pulsing, animating, emotional heart of progressive politics today. And this sometimes gets a little um, conflictual. You see younger and older staffers clashing at all kinds of institutions. Uh, the Urban Institute is a very distinguished liberal think tank in Washington. Uh, there was recently a, a young staffer, she wrote a blog post that was very kind of sweeping and it said, ideas of rigor and objectivity are part of a class of harmful research practices that have neglected marginalized people and we need to elevate their, their lived experience instead. That attracted a lot of criticism. Eventually the president of the Institute did a response piece of her own saying, you know, that was just one person's view, rigors at the core of what we do. And I kind of find myself in the middle of a generational divide that is shaking a lot of institutions in Washington. Um, and, and something that's striking to me is we've had this kind of social revolution, but it's very limited in its impact. So I've seen institutions turn completely topsy-turvy by a kind of new wave of progressive anti-racist activism. And I've also seen places that are completely untouched by it. I was, um, you know, I was at a round table dinner and everybody there was like, oh my God, the traditional concepts of meritocracy are being thrown out the window. Like everything here is so terrible. Uh, you know, the left is ruining everything. And, you know, nobody seemed to notice that, that it was a 90% male table, it was 100% white, and people are there complaining that diversity has gone out of control. And I thought, you know, not, not everywhere, you know, uh, there's a lot, a lot of places that could still use more of that. So, uh, you know, I think you can believe in the value of objectivity, and you can see also that, you know, a discussion room with that kind of demographic composition is probably not going to converge on objective truth, right? Our individual subjectivities can lead us astray. But my biggest concern when I think about where are progressives going? It's not the zeal about anti-racism as such, but it's a concern that because this movement is so grounded in a kind of community of younger people, more educated people, people living in big cities, it doesn't always distinguish between the kind of norms and verbal tics of young, educated, urbanized people and what we actually need to do to improve the lives of underprivileged people. So I, I was talking recently to somebody um, working in the federal government, somebody working on transportation policy, and he told me, you know, we want to make sure that we're looking at transportation funding with an equity lens. And, and that's a great shorthand for communicating within the sort of closed world of progressive foundations and nonprofits. I understood exactly what I meant. But I asked him, how many of the people who the equity lens is supposed to benefit how many of them recognize this kind of jargon? Like, is that a clear way of communicating the idea? We wanna make sure black neighborhoods get their fair share of the money. And if that's what you mean, like, why not just say what you mean? Why not try to communicate clearly? Um, and we've seen activists and academics, they've decided that the Spanish language has grammatical gender and that that's problematic. So they want to replace Latino and Latina with the word Latinx, which, you know, and they want to do that without regard to how a mostly older, mostly working class population of people rooted in Spanish language and Spanish speaking culture, how do they actually feel about this? Uh, and we've seen time and time again, uh, maybe most clearly in the New York City mayoral race, that a lot of the time the majority of African-American voters who it's mostly older, mostly working class population, they don't necessarily share the same ideas 
as the young activists who are out there and sort of speak for them. So a lot of progressives seem to me to actually have been in denial about the fact that both African American and Latino voters swung toward Trump in 2020 is a pretty big shift, a pretty striking shift in the electoral landscape. And when they acknowledge it, they sometimes minimize the reality that we, we've seen this across multiple cycles, that Stacey Abrams, for example, she actually did worse in 2018 with African American voters than Hillary Clinton had in 2016 and worse than Barack Obama had in 2012. Um, she made up for it by doing better uh, with white suburbanites. You know, which is fine, uh, but it's different from the story that people tell themselves about what's been happening there. And the fact that this rightward turn of voters of color has correlated with the increased centering of anti-racism in progressive politics, it suggests some kind of disconnect between what progressives think they're doing and what the people listening think is going on. Uh, so I think a lot of the people who talk a big game about we need to check our biases, we need to listen to the people most effective, we need diversity, we need representation, haven't fully practiced what we preach. Uh, there's no ethnic community in the United States that's best represented by its youngest and most educated members. And American higher education itself is this kind of homogenizing experience, right? Uh, people come from all kinds of places, but they learn certain values together they go out in the world. I mean, that's a, that's a good thing in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a strength of the system. But it means that when 20-something college graduates talk to each other across class and ethnic and cultural lines, they're not really doing diversity in the way that they think they do. Uh, so if you want to help the truly disadvantaged, you need to pay attention to who they are and what they're actually saying. We need to ask ourselves, you know, do diversity programs actually do anything at all to help working class people of all races and backgrounds? Uh, does it help kids who are in schools, you know, where so many of the kids are struggling, that the teachers are just drowning, they don't know what to do? Uh, and are we so sure it makes sense to tell, you know, th there's white people living in trailers in towns that have been devastated by deindustrialization, and do we want to tell them that? they're the big winners in life, that they have all this privilege? Does that make a lot of sense? Does it make sense to tell people whose parents moved here voluntarily from Latin America or Asia that like America's this terrible place and that opportunity is a lie? I I'm not so sure. So, you know, what's next for progressivism? Um, I'm older and wiser than I used to be, so I try not to make definitive predictions about these things. I don't wanna be proven wrong. Uh, but at its best, I think that what's next for progressivism still is this effort to fulfill the promise of the New Deal and the Great Society, to take these programs that were limited in their impact, that were not as inclusive as they should be, and to expand and extend them, and to move beyond some of the divisions that in the 70s and 80s kind of wrecked that project, that we have a more diverse society, we have a more tolerant society, we have a society where I think it is now possible to deliver on some of the promises that were made back then. Um, so I think we could do it. But at its worst, what's next for progressivism is this kind of niche politics of manners that tries and fails to impose the cultural sensibilities of younger college graduates and big city residents on a country that's just too big. It's too capacious to do that. There isn't any one way of living or thinking or talking that is gonna work for everybody. Uh, so both of these tendencies, I think, are really evident in progressive politics today. Sometimes they're openly at war with each other. Sometimes they're just coexisting a little awkwardly. So, you know, which vision of that will prevail? I don't know, only time will tell. It's a boring conclusion. Uh, the one thing I will say is that I think of myself as not just an observer of these events, but also a participant. And you know, I am trying to fight the fight for one of these outcomes. And you know, I hope I will convince people. I hope I'll do a good job. I hope I'll convince you here. But you know, we really need to see, because I think we're at a bit of a crossroads between either a great opportunity to deliver what 20th century progressives never could, or to kind of tilt into a form of irrelevant <coughs> tilt into a form of irrelevance. And you know. I hope uh, 
I hope that we choose correctly. So that's what I got. So I know you, you said, I don't know how, but is there anything you're seeing that, that you think has promised to get us to where you're talking about instead of into um, the niche equity lens jargon place that's irrelevant? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's incredible promise in some of the things the Biden administration has already done, right? So, you know, they put forward this expanded version of the child tax credit that is doing an incredible amount to reduce child poverty. And, you know, if it is fully extended, which is being proposed in Congress, this could really erase some of the big sins of the welfare reform era. And if people know about the politics of the 80s and 90s, that debate over the AFDC program, it was incredibly racialized. You know, there were, there were these real program design flaws in that program, but the argument about it was all about stigmatizing welfare moms, not improving how the program worked and improving the incentives in it. And the face of that welfare mom was almost always a black woman. Right, and it was very clearly a these people are not like me kind of politics, and it was really bad. And we have moved to a point where even as Republicans resist this programmatic effort, it is not resisted in those terms because that is really not where American society is right now. We're having a much more rational conversation about the welfare state and benefits, how to pay for it, we're talking about in economic terms. I hope that program can come through. That'll do an incredible amount to lift people up. And you know, by the way, it's true. Anything you do, right, because of all the familiar facts about legacies of discrimination, disparities in things in society, anything that you do to help the poor in the United States closes those racial gaps. And it closes racial opportunity gaps, but it does so in a way that is inclusive. You know, it helps all people who've fallen into bad circumstances, regardless of why. In the case of the child tax credit, it helps everybody who is raising kids. You know, it, it doesn't matter what your situation in life is, but that has a particular impact on the lowest end, a particular impact on African American Latino families. And I think that's like a really incredibly promising way forward, something that, you know, it, it could happen next week in Congress, and I, I really hope that it does. Thanks, I really appreciated your distinction between this kind of tradition of labor liberalism and this new cultural politics. And I guess my question for you after, you know, all the years you've been observing and participating is, is why? And that's to say, why this kind of zeal zealous cultural niche focus on particular kinds of issues, especially your own race, which not only has the sort of language issues you said, but there's a bit of a, a liberal, you know, the cancel culture thing, right? And, you know, because you could have thought of Occupy Wall Street as something that brought a lot of emotion to issues of inequality uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And still there's a lot of poverty and difficulty for many students, especially here at Grand Valley State. And, and I sort of puzzle over this, that why it's become quite so uh, impassioned, zealous, and, and almost with that radical elan, <laughs> you know, of a, of a certain kind of 60s uh, leftism. And I, I, I just was, would be curious as to your reflections. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can try to think about that on a number of different levels. My most cynical view that I fear has some correctness to it is that Occupy Wall Street, you know, it had some problems. It had some inchoate radicalism, leaderlessness, I think isn't really going to get you anywhere. But the emotions that drove that were really dangerous to people in positions of vast wealth and power in society. And so there was, it was not validated by, you know, JP Morgan didn't put up an Occupy Wall Street banner on Instagram, right? Whereas the kind of very heavily focused identity politics, while in its pure form, it's very radical and transformational and maybe misguided, in its watered down form, it's completely impotent and doesn't do anything at all. And so these kind of fake echoes of that kind of politics are actually um, reverberated out of corporate America, right? Which is happy to sort of celebrate 
diversity in a very shallow kind of sense, right? People and institutions that would never commit themselves to profound transformation of American society that lifts up the, the broad mass of people who are suffering, that helps you know, William Julius Wilson's truly disadvantaged, they are happy to participate in kind of light diversity initiative kind of stuff. And so I think that that has given a unusual combination of radicalism and non-threateningness to elites to a certain kind of movement. And you never know exactly who's talking and who's talking about what and what's happening. But it's become a kind of force multiplier for, I think, a kind of narrow political dead end. And one reason it's successful is because it's a dead end, right? Because people who don't, you know, the same people who have an army of lobbyists in Congress right now to keep egregious tax loopholes for the rich are like really happy to applaud for a certain kind of representational politics. But if you want to move the needle on the problems that are afflicting the vast majority of people of all races and ethnicities, you, you need to make those tax changes, right? That's the real politics, and it is subordinated by people who don't want to have that conversation. And I think, you know, there's other things going on in the culture, on the internet, in academia, this, that, and the other thing. But I think in some level, that movement has gotten as prominent as it has because it doesn't really go anywhere politically. Given the very narrow majority the Democrats have in Congress, do you think the Biden agenda was too ambitious and wide ranging? Well, so, Coming out of the Obama years, right, there was this critique that a lot of people made, which was that he aimed too low, right? That he would look at the landscape in Congress and say, you know, this is what I think Susan Collins might go for, and put that down. And then she wouldn't go for it, because Susan Collins isn't going to just agree with Obama's proposal, and so you'd whittle down, right? And if there's a view that the moderate members, to some extent, are engaged in arbitrary positioning, and they're gonna just cut down whatever you say, then it makes sense to start with a really high bid, right? You come in and you say, we're doing $3.5 trillion of spending. And in the end, if Joe Manchin cuts that down, he, his number right now is 1.5 trillion. And if you went back in time, and you were like, 1.5 trillion is gonna be the moderate position, you'd be like, whoa, that, that's insane. Right? That's a huge, that's a bigger than the Affordable Care Act. So I think there's a logic to the way Biden pursued this in defiance of the basic math in Congress. But you know, something I worry about, I don't know, worry about, you know, as a journalist, I, I try to communicate what's going on. I try to help people understand things in perspective. And I think that a very ambitious set of legislation might get signed and may feel to people like a crushing disappointment rather than a huge victory, precisely because they've set themselves up in this way of like throwing these huge bombs, then they get shut down. You actually settle for a very big number, but it kind of seems like you lost. So I don't know what impact that has on people in sort of second and third degree ways, because I do think that you want people to be engaged in politics, right? You want people to participate in the system. You especially want your supporters to be engaged and participate. And I think people participate more when they feel efficacious, right? And sending to people the message that you're losing, you know, can be very demobilizing. But I think when you look at the facts, this is kind of working. That Biden knows a lot about the Senate, knows a lot about how senators think, and has crafted these ideas in a deliberate way to, to get a lot done. I mean, we'll see. Unfortunately, I'm talking to you like in the middle of a congressional shit show. And the nature of Congress is that like it always seems like things are about to fall apart right up until the moment it's all agreed upon. But I, I think something is going to get through. And I think what's going to get through is going to be actually really large in scope by any comparison to past presidencies. And you know, I think it's important to keep that in mind and not just the headline numbers. I see the 
progressive failure um, on housing policy to be one of the big issues today. Yes. Um, and yes. I was just kind of wondering, what are your thoughts on the kind of progressive left's like inability to talk about housing policy in a meaningful way and where we can kind of go from there? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> this is like my big obsession in life, so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It wasn't in my talk. You know, I think if you look, I, I don't live in Michigan, so I don't know. But I think if you live in the middle of the country, right? If you live in Michigan, you live in Ohio, you live in Iowa, and you think about how are living standards in New York and California versus Texas and Georgia, right? Would I be better off moving to New York City or San Francisco, or would it be better off moving to the suburbs of Dallas? I think it is hard to make the case that you would be better off moving to New York City, right? Now, I, I grew up in New York. I love New York. I can make a strong case for New York. But the case for New York is that it's like a really cool, fun city with like a lot of good restaurants and cultural activity and stuff like that, whereas the suburbs of Dallas are kind of boring. But if I was trying to make the case for you in policy terms, right? So in New York, the taxes are higher, right? But so, OK, we're progressives. We believe in high taxes. But in exchange for the high taxes, are the public schools better? Are your commutes shorter, right? Like, is SUNY better than the University of Texas? And none of that is really true. And that's a big problem for progressives. The places that have the most progressive governance, you want to be able to say these are amazing places to live. That if you give Gretchen Whitmer a majority in the legislature, she's going to make Michigan more like this other place where Democrats have been governing for a while, and it's going to be awesome, right? And it's not that awesome. And I think that makes it really a, a hard sell. I think it, it contributes to the cultural politics feedback loop that the liberal parts of the country are places where a certain kind of person likes to live because they enjoy the lifestyle rather than because concrete benefits are flowing to people. So if you look analytically, like why is that? Why is it that a middle class person trying to raise a couple kids would have such a hard time doing that in New York City? And housing is like 80% of the story, right? So unless we can address that, in the places that we are governing, we are going to look to the rest of the country like a joke. You'd like we are not actually delivering high living standards for normal middle class people. Um, so there's been positive change. I mean, California for the past five years, each legislative session has passed a good housing bill. They're starting to see new units. We're starting to see the needle move. There were some good housing proposals in the original White House uh, version of this Build Back Better bill. Unfortunately, they were taken out somewhere in the process. And I, I, I don't know who did it, but I'm going to get them if I get the chance. Um, but you know, we, we really are going to need to address this, especially in the East Coast, where there's been much less political progress than on the West Coast. Uh, I know a couple guys in the legislature in Maryland and Virginia who are fighting the good fight. but. They don't have enough allies. Uh, but you know, if you talk to people, like what is the big problem with life in the big coastal cities? It's housing, 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 housing. And unless you tackle that, you are just not going to be able to hold your head high and say, you know, we know what we're doing. We are governing our spots well, and you should trust us with political power. And that has to be the goal, ultimately. I mean, housing is substantively important, but I think it's important even to people who don't think it's important because they see the results. So this is actually a question that came in earlier uh, for David French's AM keynote, but I want to ask you the same thing, and my, this might be a, a tease for our, our 7 p.m. address tonight. Uh, someone on Zoom had asked earlier, is there any potential for a third party that would represent the majority of moderates? Uh, I mean, you know, there are profound reasons that the electoral system is not that friendly to third parties. And so I think that's supposed to be the smart thing to say. On the other hand, if you ask uh, the comparative government people in political science departments, they say the Americanists don't know what they're talking about and that every other country in the world 
has multiple parties regardless of its electoral system. So then you go back to the Americanists. There's like a certain theory that the intersection between presidentialism and first past the post voting forces us into two parties. Um, I don't actually think that that's true. I think that if tomorrow Joe Manchin had lunch with, um, what's her name from Alaska? Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski, and said to them, said to her, look, uh, there's these parts of the country, you know, rural, very heavily white, with a lot of natural resource economies, the Democrats have just abandoned. But you and I both know that the Republicans are crazy. And we need a party that's not the Republicans, that represents people in those areas of the country. We should both leave our parties. We would control the Senate agenda. We could decide who gets all the committee assignments. Let's go do it. And I think if they did that, I think Liz Cheney out in Wyoming, who's orphaned now, I think she would join that party. And I think that, um, God, I'm losing his name. There's a Maine congressman who represents the northern part of the state, Jared Golden. And it's again, it's a very Trumpy district, but he's a Democrat. Similar characteristics, very rural, very white area, natural resource economy. I mean, it's not coal and oil there, it's trees, but it's the same thing. He's a Democrat and there's no party for people like that, for non-Republicans in rural resource intensive areas. But we know there are a lot of elected officials, right? I mean, not, not a thousand, but I've just named a bunch of people who represent those areas and don't fit into the modern GOP. And I think that if they had a little bit more creativity and courage, they could form a successful third party caucus up there. They couldn't win a presidential election, but they would have influence over the confirmation of every president's cabinet, right? And you could force people into a kind of de facto coalition arrangement. They would control the agenda in Congress. They could do things like, you know, we've had all this process bickering about the infrastructure bill versus the reconciliation bill. If you had done, if Manchin and uh, Murkowski did what I suggested, they could just say, no, we're not putting this reconciliation bill on the floor. Like, it's infrastructure, it's nothing, because we control the agenda. And I thought that um, 15 years ago, it was a different group of moderates. It was like Jim Jeffords and Joe Lieberman. It was mostly a New England thing. And I thought, you know, these New England moderates from two parties, they should quit. They should do their own thing. Uh, and of course, they didn't. We've changed political alignment. And now I think it's those resource economy areas that have this kind of potential, but people don't think in those terms. Uh, even the moderate members, even someone like Cheney, who's like halfway, more than halfway out the door of the Republican Party, like being kicked out, have a very strong emotional affiliation with the parties. And so ultimately it takes leaders, you know? And I think not like outsiders, not just some guy who's like, hey, I'm gonna have a third party, but people who are actually in politics know their states, know how to win, know how to run. I think they could do it if they wanted to. Well, the Democrats are trying to hash out this uh, 1.5 trillion versus 3.5 trillion. The Republicans have been um, obstructionists. And, mm -hmm. and how long can they just say no? Well, Republicans have been less obstructionist than I would have thought. I mean, based on the precedent of 2009, 2010, I would think they won't vote for anything. But we've got a continuing resolution. We had a bipartisan Senate vote on this infrastructure bill. We had a bipartisan Senate vote on a bill that used to be called the Endless Frontier Act, got renamed uh, USICA. I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's like a science funding bill. So there has been some Republican willingness to come to the table on certain kinds of spending policy. And I think in an interesting way, the Republican Party has moderated on certain traditional policy issues. It's not Paul Ryan and John Boehner saying, we need to cut Medicare and Social Security, we need to throw people off Medicaid, uh, but they've radicalized on political process, right? They've started really acting like it is just per se illegitimate 
for Democrats to win an election and govern. And it's very alarming. I mean, you look at what happened on January 6th, you look at how these audits are playing out, you look at how almost every Secretary of State candidate in every state is like committed to fake election fraud theories. That stuff to me is really, really alarming. But when you like turn off all the politics and just talk about like tedious policy, I think Republicans have become, relative to where they were 10 years ago, more reasonable, easier to make deals with. And that's nice unless it ends with the country tipping over into like an authoritarian dictatorship, because that's, that's not so nice. So I don't know where that leaves us. So I feel like a lot of the different things that you've touched on and people have asked about involve like needing to get progressives or liberal-minded Democrats a win in some sort of policy arena, not necessarily in the congressional level, but mm -hmm. in the state legislative okay. and the, the local level. What sort of policies do you think are the low-hanging fruits that you know, people could go out and get done that would then be like, look, here is a shining example of what a progressive-minded liberal city can do? Yeah, so I mean, I think the biggest one for state-level progressives in recent years has been Medicaid expansion, right? We've seen that be a winning issue in a lot of races. We've seen states expand Medicaid. Um, you know, it's an ongoing fight in Wisconsin nearby to here, but it hasn't been reversed in any of the states where it's happened, even very conservative ones. You know, for cities, I think that, I think that the pre-K aspect of Biden's proposal is probably gonna end up on the cutting room floor because, well, A, because they have to cut something, and B, because it's, um, it's really awkward to do it as a federal program because the federal government doesn't run schools. So it's this like elaborate uh, joint effort. But I think that pre-K in the most progressive cities, in New York and Washington, D.C., has been done, is good, is the kind of thing that you can talk about proudly. It's something that's, that's working well in those places. I think that's gonna spread to the other most progressive jurisdictions, sort of, you know, regardless of what happens in Congress, and then hopefully will be a model that people can take elsewhere. I, San Antonio is actually a good example of this, you know, because that's a, that's a red state, it's a very conservative state, but the city, it's like far from the most left-wing city, but it's solidly democratic. They did a pre-K initiative there. People really like it. The other Texas cities are looking at copying it. So that's something that um, I think is like both a good idea, it's achievable, and it also really relates to the functions of state and local government, right? They are the frontline providers of services like that. They can assess things like, well, do we have buildings for this, right? Like, how's it actually gonna work? Whereas doing it on the federal level, it kind of, I think it sounds good as two lines in a speech, but it's really hard to translate that into a policy that works. Where do you think the progressive foreign policy agenda is going? Oof, where, where is it going? I, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's always hard to characterize foreign policy in pure ideological terms, because there's more to it than that, right? Um, Biden, you know, removed troops from Afghanistan. That was controversial. I consider that, I mean, I, I agreed with him. I consider that like a good progressive foreign policy achievement. It's also something that Donald Trump was doing though. Um, and, you know, he considered that like a true conservative American first kind of initiative. And, you know, you can look at it in different kinds of ways. I think, you know, if you want to talk about a distinctively progressive idea in foreign policy, it's been trying to elevate the climate issue, you know, as an international diplomatic priority. I think it succeeded in the sense that uh, we now talk about that a lot. Like John Kerry has this job, a former Secretary of State. He travels the world talking about climate change. I don't know that we've seen concrete results from that though, right? It has not borne a ton of fruit. National politics in every country is sort of very difficult. And so you can have meetings where you talk about climate, but do you do anything on it? Now, I do think it's possible that we are going to see the US and EU come together 
on some kind of a carbon border adjustment, basically to punish China, so to speak, for having such a carbon intensive economy. And you know, that would be interesting. I mean, that would be an interesting turn in foreign policy that infuses a progressive idea into this kind of broader national security establishment of confronting China. But um, I don't know. You know, foreign policy is not the most ideological arena, and it's also not one where I think progressives have done a ton of focus. Um, and I don't think they're really likely to in the nearer term. Where do you see the leadership of the progressive movement going? Bernie's obviously getting up there. A lot of the most famous figureheads are that young, highly educated group that don't necessarily represent everyone in their demographic. What are the odds of a real progressive becoming a U.S. president in the near future? Oof. Um, I mean, I, I think that this, in the, in the left wing of the Democratic Party, I think this ideological change is interesting. I think I, I even see a big difference between Bernie of 2016, who was trying to put forward, you know, his version of a social democratic agenda, and he was willing to bite certain bullets. You know, Hillary Clinton said, oh, you're not left wing enough on gun control, right? And Bernie said in reply to that essentially, well, if I want to do a working class politics, I can't pick a big fight with working class gun owners about their hobby. By 2020, I think Bernie was off that. He actually internalized Hillary's criticisms of him, and he ran a campaign that was social democratic, was Medicare for all, was take on the billionaires, but was no longer exclusively focused on that aim, and that really incorporated a lot of left cultural politics. And when you look at the younger members who are sort of his heirs, right? You look at AOC, you look at Rashida Tlaib, you look at Ilhan Omar. Um, they are really like not making the hard choices, right? They are against the billionaires and the millionaires, but who are their allies going to be against the billionaires and millionaires? And it's like only people who are left wing on this huge menu of different issues. And that's just not a majority of the country. And to some extent, you know, Pramila Jayapal, who's like formally speaking, the leader of the Progressive Caucus, she has developed a worldview in which I think it's okay that they're not a majority, right? She wants to create a kind of Freedom Caucus of the left that will use procedural tactics and strategy to wield influence while being a minority of the Democratic Party. I mean, that's okay, I guess. But I, I don't think that she has thought seriously enough about what the Freedom Caucus actually achieved in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. Like, it's not much, right? If you think of the right wing of the Republican Party as being committed to rolling back the welfare state, dismantling elements of the Great Society settlement, they didn't do any of that. They didn't repeal the Affordable Care Act. They didn't really do anything, right? Like, yes, they stymied moderate Republicans, but they didn't accomplish anything. Trump wound up taking over as president, and he doesn't like even support half of the things that the Freedom Caucus was fighting for. So they coped with that by just becoming Trump's biggest fans. And so, you know, Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and those guys, now like all they do is, you know, they talk about um, hydroxychloroquine and election fraud, and they've like totally abandoned their agenda. So I don't understand why you would think that copying that is a reasonable path forward. And I think um, we don't have yet a leader who is trying to do majoritarian progressive politics. I think it's been bad. I think it's been really um, unhealthy for the progressive movement that the same top three House Democrats have stuck around for so long. There's nothing wrong with any of them, but so many people um, you know, have, have just left the caucus. People who seemed like they were next in line have gone elsewhere. So now it sort of falls to Hakeem Jeffries to play the role that used to be Javier Becerra's role, used to be, I'm forgetting, he's the junior senator from Mich uh, Maryland now, 
But there's been this uh, series of people who are like next in line who wound up leaving the house. And so I, I hope Jeffries like gets a chance to be in leadership really, really soon because maybe he'll be great or maybe he'll be terrible, but like we need to find out. Right now, nobody from that cohort has had the opportunity to even try and lead. So we can sit around and like guess, like what would they do? What do they think? Who are they? Are they good? I, I think he probably would be good, but like we don't know. You need to try new people out and let things form because otherwise all you get is this factional politics. I think part of the appeal of Jayapal's theory to members is that it gives them something to do, right? It, this is a thing that annoyed backbenchers could do to wield influence. But what you want to say to them is like, don't be a pain in the ass, be a team player and rise in the team. But if nobody has risen in the team for 20 years, that looks very unappealing to people. You don't get constructive thinking. So you alluded to uh, earlier the distinction between older generations and younger generations in Washington. So I'm curious for your perspective on gerontocracy and government and any ideas that you have working through that going forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, there's like, there's the older and younger generation in which we're talking about people in their 20s versus people in their 50s and 60s. Then you have what we have in Washington, which is an incredible number of people in their 70s and maybe even 80s wielding influence. And I mean, it doesn't, like, it doesn't sit well with me. Like, I just don't think that that's good for society. Um, you know, we also have to recognize that, you know, youth culture always has this incredible impact on what we talk about. Uh, because young people are very important to advertisers, they're very important to movie studios, they're important to TV networks, they're the workforce for journalism now that career ladders and media have completely collapsed. But what's actually happened in our society is that like the median age has gone up quite a lot as people have had fewer children and now we have less immigration. So to some extent, it's like it's hard to stop the spiral of gerontocracy because Joe Biden is unprecedentedly old, as is Nancy Pelosi. A lot of our Supreme Court justices are old. Uh, Stephen Breyer is frustrating me by holding on. But it's become a society that, you know, uh, especially electorally, more and more centers older people. So, you know, I mean, a simple process fix is that I think Democrats should have leadership term limits in the House the way Republicans do to ensure some kind of turnover there. But I think that that's a sort of a superficial like view of things. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I, I voted for Joe Biden in November. I think he was a good candidate, but I, but I also kind of wish he hadn't run. I mean, there was this presumption that he was too old. And, you know, there's no, there's no rule that somebody is too old. But I think, like, the norm had been that people of that age don't do it. And we should have let, you know, Amy Klobuchar or Steve Bullock be the, be the moderate lane kind of candidate there. Because it's like, it's not true that only this guy in his late 70s stood for that brand of politics. But it's further re-entrenched age polarization that like he becomes the avatar of kind of more traditional things. So, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say or do about it, but I, I think it's bad. I should probably close on something more upbeat. What's good is that, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I really do think that this idea of, I mean, I was just read a study this morning about how when people um, actually speak to each other, the level of effective polarization goes down. Um, and something we know is that like very few actual people are as polarized and like perfectly sorted in their views as members of Congress. Congress gets that way for reasons. Uh, political scientists have like complicated mathematical models where they can explain to you why that's an optimal representational scheme. But it's very unrepresentative of American society. So if your only view of political divisions is like watching the show, you're going to create this impression that like everybody is incredibly unreasonable 
when it just like isn't true, most people are somewhat nuanced in their opinions and in unpredictable ways. And there's like really no substitute for actually speaking uh, in the kind of spirit of this event to create a kind of healthier society and mentality and worldview. Because so much of what we do nowadays is reflect, refracted through like seven layers of performance on social media. And it's really toxic. I mean, I, the younger me would have hated myself for being so like earnest about civic fabric and stuff like that. Uh, but I really think it matters. I really think it's important. I really think the mission of this kind of event at, at the center really matters. I mean, if we are going to find a way forward as a country, it's going to need more events of this kind. So thank you all for listening. Uh, it's been a real pleasure.